Hello, my name is Steve Carroll and I want to tell you all about the art of one of my favourite artists. In fact, somebody who I think is probably a lot of people's favourite artist and that is the art of J.M.W. Turner. We see this self-portrait of him as a young man. He was actually born in Covent Garden in London and he was the son of a barber and a wig maker and his father was... Uh, a great encourager of him right from an early age. He used to hang his uh, child, childlike pictures very early on up in his barber's shop and tell everybody how his son, J.M.W., was going to become a great painter, which eventually, of course, he did. One of Turner's greatest inspirations was a 17th century artist called Claude Lorraine. He was born in 1600 uh, and lived until 1682 and he had this remarkable use of light. Claude Lorraine was painting in a century when there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, religious wars going on and people turned to his paintings as some kind of uh, escape, um, a, a place where they could get away from it all and dream that life could be different somewhere. And that's what he provided and that's what Turner also liked about him, his wonderful use of light. And he requested that when he died his paintings be hung up next to those of Claude Lorraine. And of course in the National Gallery in London if you go there you will find Turner's paintings hung up alongside those of Claude Lorraine. Now, um, uh, Turner became at a very young age a professor at the Royal Academy. He was a professor of perspective and a lot of people went along to his lessons not just to hear about perspective but they wanted to go and see his paintings which he'd done, his kind of educational diagrams because they thought they were so wonderful. They also went there because they wanted to laugh at his accent they thought it was funny, this guy from London talking like this to all these toffs about art, know what I mean? So uh, he caused a certain amount of amusement in the Royal Academy, but he was also, of course, uh, quite respected as a great painter. He was the type of artist who could turn his hand to any kind of painting and master it. This picture here, which is a painting of the Port of Calais, um, if you know a bit about art, you'll know that it's incredibly like Dutch 17th century marine painting. Painting. He um, you know, saw the works of people like um, Simon de Vliegia and he thought I can do that and he did just as well and it really you know, impressed people. But the thing to understand about Turner it was the age in which he lived and he lived in what we refer to as the age of Romanticism. Now, if we talk about romanticism, we nowadays we probably think of Barbara Cartland and sort of romantic novels and all that type of thing. But that's not where the name came from. It's not what it originally meant. Romanticism was a movement which started in Germany, and it was actually a literary movement. Um, there were lots of German poets, but it soon spread into the visual arts. And what it was all about was a personal reaction to the awesomeness of nature, a personal reaction to the awesomeness of nature. And so you get lots of paintings of storms and snowstorms and earthquakes and things like that during the Romantic period. Another thing that you see a lot of is paintings of ruined castles all covered in ivy. Because one of the things they believed was that human beings were only going to be on this planet for a short while, but nature would be on this planet for forever. It always had done and it always will do. It will outlast mankind. So you get a lot of these um, paintings and drawings of old ruins covered in ivy. Um, Tintin Abbey was a very um, uh, popular uh, inspiration. It inspired people like William Wordsworth, the poet, and also Turner. And here we have um, some paintings of him in uh, the Lake District. And this painting here is what we would call a history painting. It actually is a depiction of Hannibal crossing the Alps. But again, he seems more interested not in the history of Hannibal and his remarkable feat of crossing the Alps on elephants. He seems more interested in the storm, in this incredible vicious snowstorm that's going to come along and that can any moment completely engulf them. 
Now, he was somebody who constantly kept sketchbooks. He kept drawings and watercolours. Sometimes he actually had his own paper made. He would um, paint in watercolour on a tinted paper, which is quite interesting. Um, these drawings here, they show, you know, fast sketches of the countryside. At first, of course, he couldn't really go anywhere apart from England, and so a lot of his paintings and drawings are of places like the Lake District, Wales, and the Pennines, because, of course, the um, Napoleonic Wars were going on, and it was impossible to travel around Europe safely. But when the Napoleonic Wars ended, he started going to uh, other places uh, abroad, and one of the places he went to was Switzerland, and he did these wonderful studies in watercolour and then paintings of uh, Switzerland with these beautiful colours, these beautiful blues, this incredible sense of atmosphere of, uh, if you look at the mountains as they go away from you, further away, they become more and more indistinct, more and more away into the mist, whereas the figures swimming in the lake in the foreground are very distinct. Here's another one where he's using the same technique. Can you see how the um, well the, the reflection in the lake in the foreground, which is quite beautiful, uh, that's quite clear. But as you go away, the mountain in the, in the distance is getting less clear. And can you see with this, he's done this in watercolour. And then what he's done, he's, he's drawn over it with red ink, with a, a pen and a nib pen, and drawn in the detail, which is really quite lovely. Uh, what Turner was all about, and this is, I think, one of the most important things we could say about Turner's technique, was that when it came to his romanticism, the element that he was most fascinated with was light. And he felt that you could use watercolour to capture the flow of light, the way light um, enveloped around objects, the way in which light dissolved objects. This could all be done through watercolour. And then what he wanted to do with his oil paintings was he wanted to get his oil paintings looking as much like the watercolours as possible. So that was really his technique. It was the depiction of light using a very loose watercolour effect, and which in oil painting he then tried to emulate that feeling of the watercolours. Another place which was a favourite site of his, of course, was Venice. I don't know if you've ever been to Venice, I have, and um, the light is remarkable because you've got a, a city with no roads, just canals, and the light is coming down, there's a strong Mediterranean light coming down, and then it's, uh, you know, it's actually reflecting off the water, it's reflecting everywhere, and it's a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere there. Now, the great turning point for Turner really began in this, with this picture here. This was in... Um, 1835, he created this painting, but the year before, 1834, um, the House of Commons had caught fire. And he heard a rumpus going on, he lived in London, and he thought, what's going on? And he found out that the House of Commons was on fire. So he hired uh, a chap to row him into the middle of the Thames, and he took his sketchbook and his watercolours, and with just three colours, he captured over and over again the effect of the burning, the effect of the light. Now, I'm afraid I can't show you those, because there's a very heavy copyright on them, and they don't like them to be uh, reproduced. In fact, you know, um, it's very you can find them on the uh, on, on Google Images. Please go looking for them, those watercolours of the burning of the House of Commons. But I'm not uh, allowed to show you them in this uh, video. But what I can show you is this wonderful oil painting that was created as a response. Now, I don't know about you, but I think those flames are far too high, far too dramatic. But what a fantastic picture this really is. And then here is another one which shows it, uh, the fire from Westminster Bridge, the old Westminster Bridge. It looks a bit strange because it looks as if the bridge suddenly tumbles down halfway through the picture. But what that is, is the terrible smoke coming up and just hiding the bridge. And can you see in the foreground all the people watching? And, you know, they're just put in very, very, um, very, you know, economically, not too much detail, but they're all crowding, looking at this incredible sight. Now, this incident had a huge effect upon his art, making him paint in a far more 
loose way, a far more dramatic way, a far more unfinished way in some ways. And some people look at his later stuff. I mean, you know, I've heard people say, oh, this is when he was going a bit mad, wasn't it? I don't think so. I think he'd just been liberated. He just realised that colour and light, it was unbridled. It was something that wasn't contained. It was something you could really let, let rip with. And he started doing these very simple sketches, which are... Um, you know, that, that, that there's hardly anything to them, but they are, in fact, uh, really very atmospheric, really quite wonderful. Um, sunsets, clouds above the sunsets, um, just the indication of maybe um, birds or a pier or something in the water. But that's all it needed to just get across what he actually saw. And he started bringing this into his oil paintings. This one here is a landscape with a river where things are beginning to dissolve, things are beginning to disappear because the light is so strong it's actually bleaching out everything else. And if you've ever been for a walk on a really hot sunny day when the sun is very very bright you know that this is what the sun does. This is why you put sunglasses on. It's almost as if Turner is taking his sunglasses off and he's looking into the light where nobody else would look and he's seeing what it actually does to the landscape. And then likewise uh, this is one of the Thames um, which is, looks incredibly like um, there's another fire going on. I don't think it is. But it's actually just, you know, the, the bustle of the, the Thames, which of course was an industrial route, and it still is, going through the city of London. Um, barges taking, you know, all sorts of goods up and down the river. But can you see how those unfinished brushstrokes in the sky, those white brushstrokes, he actually got criticised for those. People said they looked like soap suds, which he got very upset about. Uh, but, you know, it's a very, very spontaneous, very, very fast painting with, again, light is dissolving things as well as, you know, in some ways in the shadows, you can see things actually emerging through the mist. He also did these wonderful interiors. He was a great friend of Lord Egremont at Petworth House in uh, West Sussex. And um, he was, you know, although he was rather a, a vulgar chap, somebody who, you know, spoke with quite a strong accent like that, he still got um, invited to quite, um, you know, posh do's. And um, he, he was a, a great favourite of uh, Lord Egremont. And um, he used to sit and, you know, at the, at the back uh, watching what was going on and doing these little sketches. And then look at these paintings he did where it you can't actually work out, for example, what people are wearing. Uh, you can't work out what the, the details of ladies' dresses or anything like that. But what you do get is this incredible sense of atmosphere, of the light coming through those high windows, of the light reflecting off uh, furniture and some of the... Um, the figures are in silhouette and some of them are in this incredibly strong sunlight. It's a remarkable picture. And one of my favourites that's in the Tate um, is this one here. It was thought that this was actually Petworth House again, but it's now thought that this is um, a house in on the Isle of Me uh, Isle of Wight, sorry. And uh, what you've got here is, again, the light coming in. And this, I don't know what this is on the floor. It looks like a shipwreck to me. But if you look carefully, you can see things like little dogs. You can see a piano. You can see what I'm, I suppose is some kind of like chaise lounge or something like that. But it's, uh, it, it, it's very indistinct. But this is the direction that he wanted to go. He wanted to depict light, depict light and show what it actually did to the world around him. And of course, his most famous painting is The Fighting Temeraire, which is this one here, again in the National Gallery. Um, this is world famous. People come from all around the world to visit the National Gallery to see this wonderful painting. And a lot of people think of it as a sad painting because they look upon it and they think, well, what it is, is there's a, um, uh, a steamboat, a steam tugboat, and it's pulling away this old tall ship, which was actually, um, which actually fought in the Battle of Trafalgar. And it's the old ship, the old sailing ship that's being towed away by the steam tug. And in those days, uh, the steam tug in this painting was sometimes criticised. People referred to it as a sooty little monster. And that's so uh, that's what people think. It's about a sad painting, 
the sad scene with the sun setting on the age of sail. The problem is, it's not that at all. It's, if this was actually going away to be um, um, decommissioned and broken up, then it's going down the wrong, the wrong direction with the sun in that position. This isn't um, actually a sunset, this is a sunrise. And it could just be that what Turner is saying is, isn't this exciting? We're getting rid of the old antiquated way of sailing and we're going towards the great new steamships. And that's what it could be. It's not at all a sunset. It's a new dawn, a new dawn of steam, which he was very excited about because Turner wasn't somebody who lived in the past. He was very excited about new developments, new developments in science, new developments in technology, new developments in painting, and he was also fascinated with photography, which was a, a, a new um, method that was coming into use by artists. My very favourite painting is this one here. This is Norham Castle. And this is one of the last paintings he ever did. And some spoil sports say it's not finished, but I don't care if it's finished or not. I think it's actually a very, very beautiful painting. Here again, we have the sun setting behind a castle and you can't actually see the castle. You can't make out the architecture or anything like that. It's just casting a shadow down that hill and into this river. And here you can just about make out an animal. Is it a cow? I think it's a cow. And it's stopping to drink from the water. But there's this incredible sense of peace, incredible sense of beauty, an incredible sense of what we call the sublime. And the sublime originally in the late 18th century did not mean uh, peaceful. It meant to be aware of the awesomeness of nature and the grandiosity of nature. And uh, all the way through Turner's work, I think that's one of the things that you are really aware of, just how incredible nature is, how incredible light is. Now, he's had a huge effect upon other artists. Um, the generation of artists that came after him uh, in France, a, generation, uh, a group called the Impressionists. Uh, Claude Monet, who I consider to be the greatest Impressionist and certainly the leader of the group, he, during the Franco-Prussian War, which was from um, 1870 to 1871, a very brutal war which act where Paris was actually in the line of fire, a lot of artists left Paris and they went to London, and Monet was one of them. And he had not had a great career as an artist before this time. He'd really struggled. And he found the work of Turner. And when he saw Turner, he just said, I'm on the right track. This guy's done it. This British guy's done it. Why can't I do it? And so he went back after the Franco-Prussian War. Here is in 1872. And he just set up his easel in a very kind of industrial part of, the, uh, of an estuary and painted a sunrise, just like Turner did. And he painted the effects of light on the water, the effects of the mist and the cloud, how the sunlight appeared in the clouds, how it, uh, you know, what it did to the uh, forms in the foreground. They're getting very, very indistinct, but they're becoming silhouetted as you come towards the front, the, the foreground of the painting where you see that dark boat is. But he didn't just inspire uh, realistic painters. He also inspired abstract painters. His use of paint was so exciting, it was so different, it was so new, that it actually inspired the American abstract painters, painters like Jackson Pollock, and painters like this chap here, Mark Rothko. Now, Mark Rothko is not everybody's cup of tea, I know. Some people might say, well, what's that? But can you see in this that feeling of a Turner, that feeling of cloud illuminated by sun, the way in which it, it's that orange area glows from the centre and then goes out, dissipates into the, the edges, and then that dark block in the foreground, which although it's a dark blue, it still has a kind of a glow to it, rather like one of Turner's uh, seas or one of his rivers. Anyway, I hope that's been of an inspiration. I look forward to coming to see you where we can actually uh, practice some of these techniques. And I certainly look forward to that. Cheerio.